Hi everyone, welcome back to our talks with experts from Seidenberg and from PACE. Uh, today, I have the privilege of talking to Professor Isaac Magefi about his research and about all the great stuff that he's done at PACE. So without me talking about it much longer, I'll just let him introduce himself and his work. Thank you, Aswan. So yeah, my name is Isaac Wagefi. I'm an assistant professor at Seidenberg. I'm associated with the Department of Information Systems. Um, I moved here from another institution. I was a professor at um, SUNY Binghamton um, in upstate. And before that, I did my PhD in Canada. I went to McGill University in Montreal. Um, so, so far I have done multiple projects since I've been at Pace University, but I think it's useful if I give you an overview of what I'm doing in general. So my research uh, starting from when I was a graduate student has been focusing on um, various user behaviors, uh, especially with online technologies such as social networks, such as smartphones and video games. And I have been interested in what's now known as the dark side of technology. So I'm looking at the negative behaviors mostly. So my main focus has been so far on addictive behaviors and compulsive use. So what makes people start using a technology but then use it to a point of developing an addiction. And when we say addiction, it's excessive amount of dependence at a point where it might have some negative effects on your life given it would interfere with your social relationship. It might um, interfere with your tasks you have to do. Let's say you have a deadline for your work or for an assignment and you miss it. And also it might have some negative psychological effects that are now becoming more and more known such as depression, anxiety you might have experienced from you know, seeing other people's pictures and what they post and whatnot. And also there's a fair level of um, physical problems. So there's a correlation between the sleep disorders and the amount of time you use your phone, especially at night. Um, so all of those have been the focus of my research. Now, more recently, last couple of years, I have been focusing on now, what can we do now to control or bring down these behaviors or find some sort of a remedy? Um, a notable project that I have been doing since I've joined Pace University, and this is something that some of my universities have been involved with too, is um, I have been studying this phenomenon called social media abstinence, which is we decide to take a break, let's say a week or two weeks or four weeks, sometimes it's just too much, or maybe you have exams, final exams are coming, or you have very serious deadlines. So I've seen that people are taking a break. So I started to look at this behavior and I was interested to see what makes it successful. What makes you disconnect from a technology and be able to sustain this connection? Like if you deactivate Facebook and you go back on it the day after, you're probably not gonna see any positive effect, but if you can deactivate at least for a week and then, then you start to see some positive effects and now seeing those positive effects might make you more motivated to keep it closed. So that's what I've been looking. So what I did was I designed an experiment. I had about a thousand people run the study where um, I invited them to deactivate their Facebook account or their Twitter or Snapchat, one of these. And then they reported to me um, stuff that I was measuring, some measurement items. And I asked them also to report, like write a diary about how they feel and what they experience. And at the end of the week, I gave them an opportunity to go back on the device if they wanted to. And then we measured again, different things. And um, I asked them again to explain what made it so difficult or less difficult. And um, I analyzed that data recently um, now I submitted it to a journal for review. But what we found was that even after a very short period of time, which is a week, which might some people might think, oh, it's too, way too long for not being on social media. But if you think about it, it's just one week. You know, you have 52 weeks in a, in a year. 
you'd be probably using this for 10 years. So a week break is really not much in a scale of you know this long-term use. But what we found was that even a single week of break from media, social media, will significantly improve your productivity. So we will have a noticeable change. And the second thing well, which was more important for me was you will gain some sort of an awareness where people then report to have more intention to stay disconnected from technology. So if you're in it and you're using it and everybody around you uses it for a long time, there's no reason for you to break it and you will never feel the need to do it. But if you start to get to try this for a little bit, then you will see, oh, it looks like maybe I'm not missing too much or look, looks like I can get more work done, you know, less distraction, less disruption, also less amount of time spent on social media, which is now on average about two hours, which is, we're talking about the average. So a lot of people use it actually a lot more than two hours a day. So that has been my primary interest. And beside that, I have a second interest, which is on now use of data analytics um, in healthcare. So I have been studying use of technology in healthcare for many years. And I have done studies looking at the use of, for instance, mobile health apps. Um, I have done studies on use of technology for geriatrics, for senior people. And now more recently, I'm interested to see how we can uh, take advantage of uh, artificial intelligence to you know, improve the quality of care and the services we deliver in the country. So that's an ongoing project um, and I'm doing it with the help of some of the assistants at Pace University. Students that come here are very bright, um, um, really uh, impressive. And I've had a chance actually to publish with one of my students just this year um, with the help of one of my students at Pace. Um, we published a paper in a very prestigious conference uh, on system sciences. So. Um, I'm doing this other paper on artificial intelligence and healthcare, where we look at the trends across the industry for the past 10 years, which is fairly um, the amount of time where AI has picked up. Um, and we're trying to see now what has been the benefits. Let's say um, there has been significant impact on, you know, reducing medical errors, um, drug conflicts, you know, drug prescription. Um, conflict has been a major issue. We're looking at image processing and how that has been improved in terms of diagnosis, the speed of diagnosis, and also the accuracy of diagnosis improved. We're looking at how AI can help. Um, a, a very recent project, we look at natural language processing and how it, that has been used in um, healthcare, which is one of the areas that are relatively underutilized. So we're trying to see what has been done how we can improve it. And again, that also I'm using a couple of our graduate students at Pace University. So that looks like to be uh, to provide some promising results, you know. Yeah, um, I do want to ask you then, in what direction do you see AI going in the future? Just the industry, where do you see it going? But also, I think this question can be applied to social media as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is no stopping either to social media to AI. I think it's important to recognize, I don't undermine, I don't deny the benefits of social media. Um, what I'm advocate for is um, very regulated use of social media that only provides the benefits. And I think there's a lot of benefits to it, but at the same time, it comes at some serious, serious costs. Um, I was, um, directing some of my students to see this, this, this recent documentary on Netflix came, uh, came out, Social Dilemma. And in that, they, they do talk about how this, and I have worked with one of those companies actually. So these are labs in California and they have multi-million dollar funds. And what they do is that they work with top tech companies given Facebook, Amazon, Google, and their job is to find ways where they can increase users' interaction with the platform. And the more time you spend on these platforms, it means more revenue for them. So all they care is that how much is time you spend on it. Now, they are aware, these companies are aware of the side effects. 
But just because there's so much money involved and these are corporations for profit, I don't think they're gonna try hard to stop users from you know, developing that kind of dependence. Um, same thing with AI. I mean, AI has shown to change industries and I don't think that it's gonna go back. I mean, a lot of industries, including social media companies are using AI excessively and extensively. Um, but again, now there needs to be some regulations, you know, there should be some policy making in terms of how AIs make decisions or how they are, they're profiling people, how they are imposing people to things that they're not supposed to do, uh, and basically how much they're taking control away from the user and give it back to the companies that will use it for profit. So that's, that's the whole idea. But again, when we talk about healthcare, AI, definitely it's, it's gonna save lives. So it's, it's, it's impressive. When we're, when we're talking about marketing, then we're talking about different, different ideas. When we talk about social media and how they use AI, then we're talking about different, you know, they're not saving lives. So they're money, you know, generation machines, so. Yeah, and um, so from all of this research that you've done lately, Ha, have there been any results of a study that you conducted that just completely um, went the other way to maybe what you were compared to what you were expecting? Yeah, were? yeah. I mean, this research we're doing on social media abstinence, I was, I hypothesized that uh, staying away from social media will definitely have some improvement on your overall sense of well being and life satisfaction, which there was some evidence for it, you know, like, um, again, given that it can create some negative feelings. Um, but what we measured and what we found out was that there wasn't really change in terms of your overall reported well being or life satisfaction. And I can see some explanations for that. Because again, we like social media, I mean, everybody likes social media, and there's so much joy it brings to our daily life. Again, the boring moments are gone. Maybe now we feel more bored because there's social media. So we need some serious excitement to feel excited um, compared to like 30 years ago. But if you keep that in mind, so when you don't use social media, you might actually have some feeling of anxiety about, I know a lot of people just told me like, oh, if I keep it down for five days, I don't know what's going on with my friends. So you have that fear of missing out, they call it, or their, their friends may call them and say like, oh, why are you not on social media, uh, blah, 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 you know? So, so those are things that might counterbalance some of the positive effects on your well-being. So yeah, uh, you don't see some pictures or you feel less depressed to see that some people are having a great vacation, but at the same time, you have more anxiety about things that you don't see. So. Um, that's something that I, I think a longer term study, like a study that's been done in multiple years and be able to, to capture. Um, but, but there's definitely, you know, more work in there. Yeah. Um, and then it, when, when we started talking, you mentioned um, that as part of your research of the dark sides of the web, um, mm -hmm. you looked into video games as well. Mm -hmm. So how's that? How does it correlate other than yeah, just spending too much? Yeah, time? I mean, video game is a is a different um, product and it comes with different, I mean, the demographics of people who are playing games and people who are use social media are quite different. Social media, now everybody uses social media. Your parents might social media, like kids uh, that are much younger will use social media. But when we talk about video games, um, the, the, the range that it creates problem is usually young adults, um, maybe in a range where people start to go to university, like high school and like early university, uh, maybe freshmen. Um, and, um, so, and also it's mostly boys compared to girls that have dependence on technology. But one of the major findings that I have found in my studies and also it has been repeatedly validated is that when we talk about social media and internet addiction in general, actually uh, female users 
are more prone to develop an addiction. Now, I haven't studied why, but this is a trend that I have seen in my work. But when we talk about video games, it's more boys that are more you know, susceptible to develop an addiction. But again, very similar pattern in terms of what happens to your brain, same uh, level of the, you know, um, and it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm reporting this to you. I haven't found it myself, but some of the people I work with, and these people are neuroscientists, they have found that the way a drug addiction works, the changes that it does to your brain are very similar when, when we talk about technology addiction. So it does create some similar effects like withdrawal, uh, mood modification, salience, tolerance. These are very, very similar effects. So same thing with, with, uh, for video games too. Um, yeah, and don't they also compare um, the, I mean, I guess the strength of the dopamine, dopamine hit that you get from seeing a notification yeah. on social media that somebody liked your photo, I think it's been compared to like, yeah, very comparable. I would say very comparable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but again, again, if you want to think about it, think about the likelihood of getting drugs, even marijuana is still legal in New York City, in New York State. Um, how likely you're going to get that versus a notification on your phone, which everybody is now exposed to that, right? Kids, you know, adults, nobody can get away from it. Uh, notifications on you and your social media and also think about again all the, uh, the the pictures and the colors and the the new things that you see now our brain i mean the new generation especially younger individuals uh, generation z these people are like um really used to internet like they've been uh, born and raised literally on internet so they are used to this in a different way that older people will interact with, it, te with technology. Um, again, um, there's good things to it, there's bad things to it. You know, these people are, um, young people are very fluent with technology, but at the same time, they constantly need to have that new thing coming, given it's, it's a new news, it's an update on your Facebook feed or on your Instagram you constantly searching for something new. Now, the problem with that is that the more you're exposed to that, your attention span will deteriorate. So it's gonna be harder and harder for you in order to do, let's say a 45 minute um, reading or assignment without distraction. Let's say even 20 minutes. Now, as an educator, I deal with that in my classes. So when I teach, I know that every, at, at, at 20 minutes, I have to break the class with different activity. I have to change the pace because I know that over 20 minutes, my students are not gonna be listening. And part of the reason is because our attention span is constantly getting shorter. I mean, same thing when you compare my work to my the way my dad or my grandfather worked, they will be able to sit down and read a book for six hours. I can't do that anymore. So again, it's, it's all comparative. So that's something we need to um, pay attention to. And again, there's value in uh, doing work uninterrupted, doing work focused, the quality of the work, let's say you're doing an assignment, if you're interrupted five times versus you were not interrupted, the quality will come true always. Your, your, your professors will know how much time you spend on this, they would know if you were focused or not. So, those are the things that, again, they will take away from your productivity. And that's something I, I have established in my studies too. The quality of your output will significantly change uh, based on you know, uh, the amount of uninterrupted work you can, you can put in. So those are, again, I, I see more side effects, but again, obviously there are, there are, good, there are benefits to them too. You know? And my last question is just kind of, do you, ha do you have any tips that you found for how what people can do to self-regulate themselves with this? Yeah. I mean, what I offer, a lot of people will call extreme, but I have found something that works for myself. I remember when I needed to write down my dissertation and I had a deadline and I had to finish and I had to defend it and there was no way going around it. I shut down my Facebook for six months. It was very hard for the first week. It was super hard for the second week, 
But then after that, I'm like, mm, I know that I'm missing some, but like, honestly, it's not the end of the world. So I encourage everybody to try getting breaks and getting breaks is reduces your dependence significantly. So when you get a break, when even when you go back, you will check it, but less frequently and you don't feel the constant need to check it. So if there are occasions, I mean, I know, I mean, everyone's prone to this, like when you have a hard deadline or we have a very tough assignment, it's, it's, it's your escape, right? Like you're like, oh, you know, I have a very difficult task on my desk. Let's just do five minutes of this and that or do video games. And I like, I mean, there are studies showing that video game playing time goes up during final exams, which is because of the amount of pressure people. So it's, it's a way to escape. Um, so again, to reduce this correlation between, you know, if I have a tough job at hand, I have to definitely, you know, use social media or any other technology, you need to, again, set deadlines. Now, um, if we're talking about like um, Apple phones or iPads, you can set, um, you know, their, their, their reports, right? They will tell you how much screen time you had. So you can, you should definitely monitor those and set deadlines for yourself and definitely try to meet them, not just to set deadlines and just like, okay, I, I was planning for like one hour and now it's three hours, but it's fine. So it needs a little bit of a self-control, definitely. Um, it's not something that will happen by itself, unfortunately, again, because the way they operate in the, the, um, the, in the brain and the reinforcement mechanism that they establish in our brain and, and again, everybody is prone to this. I'm, I'm studying this for years and I'm prone to it. Like I know that if I let it go, I will become super dependent on it because these companies are really good. They're spending billions of dollars to make these devices ridiculously good. So the only way to fight it is again, again, just be aware of it and like try to enforce it self-control. I mean, there's no way around it. Thank you very the more you much. Do it, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Like, I mean, like any other tough job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much for, for sharing your research, for sharing this advice. Um, it was very interesting to, to talk to you about it. I'm sure it will be very interesting to listen to. So, yeah, everyone, thanks for listening. And we'll be back with some more experts. All right. Thank you, Swain.